name is Paula Marantet, and I am the chair of the Committee for Assessment of Academic Skills at Augustana. And for those joining us live stream, welcome. I have put my email address on the board, which is the shockingly simple paula at uelberta.ca. If you didn't get a handout, send me an email, and in a few minutes I'll try and make sure you do. Um, and I'm going to actually uh, let Jerome Melanson say something first. Thanks. Um, I'm uh, Jérôme Monasson, I teach here um, at the Augustana campus. Um, I'm a sessional instructor here, and as such, I'm very happy to be getting this kind of, uh, of a workshop on, uh, on grading. It's, after all, a very important part of, of our job, and takes up a lot of time, so it's great to have this kind of feedback early on. It's great to have this kind of feedback on an uh, ongoing basis throughout our careers, too. I'm also the chair of the Aboriginal Engagement Committee here on campus. Um, and um, uh, uh, we've um, worked over the last while to create a statement to acknowledge um, the traditional territory. Um, so this is the first official uh, occasion we have to do so in a public manner. And I'm very glad to acknowledge, as we gather here today, uh, that the land on which we stand is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional meeting ground for many indigenous peoples. The territory on which the Augusta campus of the University of Alberta is located, provided a traveling route and a home to the Cree, the Blackfoot, and the Métis, as it did for the Nakoda, the Tutina, the Chipoyan, and other indigenous peoples. Their spiritual and practical relationships to the land create, uh, create a rich heritage for our learning and our life together as a community. Thank you, Jerome. I really appreciate the work of this committee to provide us with this text and support us in recognizing our faculty has focused on program level assessment of our core academic skills. At Augustana, our students learn to be better thinkers, researchers, and communicators. In the context of such a learning community, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Barbara Walberg to help us think about grading and how we can use it to provide effective feedback to our students about their learning and how we can do it, sometimes a lot of it, and still claim time to nurture our own well-being. Dr. Walberg worked with Augustana faculty members yesterday on assessment issues at the program level, and we look forward to matching that information with a chance to think about assessment at the classroom level. Dr. Walberg has an extensive background in the scholarship of teaching and learning, particularly with respect to writing, writing across the curriculum, and assessment. Her own academic background is in English literature, and she taught interdisciplinary humanities courses for more than 30 years, much of that at, the, uh, at Notre Dame in Indiana. She has many publications to her name, but I particularly want to point out this book, which is uh, a favorite of mine, <laughs> uh, Effective Grading, and the reference for this book is in the handout on the last page. And very recently, I believe last week, published a new book entitled Assessing and Improving Student Writing in College, a Guide for Institutions, General Education, Departments, and Classrooms. The reference for that is not on the handout, and I've written the the reference out here on the, on the board. Um, I've ordered a copy and the library will order a copy um, and you may want your own. <laughs> I don't know, but I think that we will be working from that in the next time to come. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Barbara Wolf. I promised yesterday that if you came to this workshop, which you obviously did, that we would work on how you can be more effective and time efficient, keep your grading time within reasonable boundaries in the semester to come. So that's what we're going to do. I have a handout. Anybody not get a copy? I'll get some. Um, and uh, the handout is a collection of resources. It's not a step-by-step -step journey through the workshop. So what I'd like to do at the beginning of this workshop is to ask you to find somebody in this room, somewhat near you, but you can get up, find somebody you don't know or don't normally talk to, and tell them one question you have about grading or one thing you'd like to see discussed about grading in this, in this uh, two-hour seminar. And I'm giving you two minutes for that. Stand up. Find somebody you don't normally talk to and share one question you'd like to have answered about your grade. Okay, Anne Marie. Okay. Obviously, I don't normally talk to you about grade. No. So here we are. 
students attend to when they get back their grades? Um, one is consistency in 
marking which way to relate to the fairness issue. And the second one is uh, giving feedback the student's view is useful uh, or helpful in their learning, which may relate to those two items that are on there. Uh, my question was, uh, how do you provide personal commentary and keep the time down? in the field. And she kept saying that to them. 
She kept saying, this is what it takes to be an architect. This is, what, this is how your work will be judged. And she composed a rubric for them, a very specific rubric that laid out how she would judge their architectural plans. And she explicitly said to them, this is what you're going to find when you get out there in the profession. This is how your work will be judged. Not that every architect will agree, or every client will agree on the quality of your work, but there are a set of fairly well understood and shared um, ideals here, or standards for work, and this is what it is. I'm an architect, I'm telling this to you. I think that we can take a page from her book and try to ensure in our assignments, in our written assignments, and in the uh, grading sheets, or the this is what I'm looking for sheets, or the rubrics that we use, that these are, as we are bringing them to our students, these are the um, standards, the criteria that they are likely to find in the field. So I want to um, turn to an actual rubric in the handout, and it begins on page 15. This is what I call a full rubric. That is, every level of performance in the rubric is described separately. These numbers at the left-hand side are not points. Instead, they are indicators of levels of performance. So what this rubric is going to result in is an indicator of the level of the student's performance in writing a scientific title, an indicator of the level of student's performance in writing the introduction, and so on like that. You can turn this kind of sheet, of course, into a grading sheet. But this particular instance of it is not a grading sheet per se. It could be used to guide students' work, which is how this professor uses it. It could be used to give feedback to students on their work. And then, OK, this is your grade, and this is the rubric on which I let you know where you stand in each of these different areas. Any questions about how this rubric works? OK. So <clears throat> what this? And what this instructor has done is to identify, as rubrics do, the items that she wants to evaluate. So the title, the introduction, the scientific format, and so on. And then if you look down at the bottom of page 15, you can see how the rubric is set up. Under the materials and methods section, level five, which is the highest, contains effective, quantifiable, concisely organized information that allows the experiment to be replicated, and so on. You see how specific she's being? This is one of the ways to convey to students the, um, ex the, the exact, ex exact is not the right word, the detailed expectations that she has about this work. The more specific you can be, the more fair you will appear to your students. Because then they see, OK, these are the standards. And the more consistent you can be for yourself. One of the advantages of a rubric is that it helps you be consistent in your evaluation of student work. The next, on page 16, level 4, as above, but commits what is a cardinal sin for scientists, and for some of the rest of you in your disciplines as well, unnecessary information and or wordy descriptions. Level three presents an experiment that is definitely still replicable, but has some other problems, and so on down. Anytime you do a rubric, share it with your students before they begin the project. It's a teaching tool. You see the R word that appears in every single level of performance under materials and methods? Yeah. Replication. Replication. Replicable, 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 replicable. What is this science scientist doing? She is reinforcing for her students the importance of the principle of replicability that lies behind a great deal of scientific work and the way in which that scientific work is conducted and explained to readers. So here's another tip. When you are talking about standards, help students to understand 
why this standard exists. The materials and methods section of a scientific report is built this way. Uh, uh, um, people in the field agree, have agreed to build it this way so that we can all operate by the principle of the replicability of scientific work. And as your students read scientific articles, as they conduct their own scientific research, as you present research to them in lecture or in textbook, you can just keep reiterating these are the understood principles. They have a reason. They developed not idiosyncratically, but for good purposes. And there is general agreement, or maybe only partial agreement, in the field about what these standards are. You've got to, throughout your course, you've got to be setting the stage for explaining these, these criteria and these principles to your students and helping them to see that you can be both consistent and you can be fair. Now, what about the subjective? To some extent, this is subjective still, isn't it? I have seen this rubric used, as a matter of fact, with a number of biologists, each looking at the same set of student papers and independently scoring those papers by this rubric. And there is, among biologists, pretty good agreement because the rubric is so specific, but there is some difference. And it would pay to explain that to your students. But let's take, a, so there is some subjectivity, if you want to call it that, some variation in the way that these principles are interpreted. Let's take a look at another rubric that tries to explain something quite ephemeral. Page 19. Page 19. Look at the second item on this rubric. You'll see this rubric is set up horizontally, not vertically, but it's the same principle as the science one. Complexity and originality. No, level five. This essay is unusually thoughtful, deep, creative, and far-reaching in its analysis. The writer explores the subject from various points of view, acknowledges alternative interpretations, recognizes the complexity of issues in literature and in life. Other works are brought in, and then the essay shows a curious mind at work. Now there's one instructor's attempt to describe a really ineffable quality of essays of literary interpretation. But this is, in fact, a real standard in the field. If you read literary uh, critics' analysis of one another's work, you will find these standards at play. So it's important to explain to your students that these are standards in the field ineffable though they may be, and there will be some difference in the way that different literary critics um, uh, evaluate one another's work, and some differences in the way that I and other literature teachers may evaluate your work, but this is what we care about. So now I'd like to hear some ideas. How could these two instructors, the science instructor and the literature instructor, help to make clear to these students that these rubrics are not idiosyncratic machinations of my own fervent imagination. These are, in fact, interpretations or statements about the standards that exist in the field. How could these two instructors have done that? Ideas? Well, one thing, Stand up and say, say who are. Well, Harlan, one, one thing that comes up in English classes is, is, is of course, you know, they, they expect that uh, they should parrot my perspective. But I don't really care if it's my perspective or somebody else's perspective, as long as it's well supported, uh, well documented, that sort of thing. So, I mean, that's the interesting part of the subjectivity. This may not be a, a, an opinion I like, but it doesn't mean I can't give them an A for it. So, I mean, I think that's an important distinction to make. So it's Does this instructor explain that on this rubric? No. But she could. Yeah. You may explain it in class, 
But where is that explanation that you give orally in class? Where is that explanation going to turn up when the student really needs it? If you provide your students with a rubric, it will be one of the most commonly referred to documents that students use when they are preparing their papers. Anything you want to convey to them, put it on the rubric or put it on the assignment sheet. Don't rely on just having clarified it in class. So I would suggest that on this rubric, you have a statement at the top saying these are well understood um, criteria for work in the discipline. Understand that this is different. Meeting these criteria is different from interpreting the literature the way you think I want you to interpret it. That's not an issue here. You could say something like that right up front on the rubric and then emphasize it in class on the web in the assignment sheet and so on. Stand up. Who are you? I'm Tom Thurston, a uh, biologist. So uh, in biology, we very often have assignments based on labs. And sometimes lab just simply did not work. What to do in terms of rubric and fairness? I mean, I still, I still need to give them a mark, right? Okay, so are, are all of them get A or B? <laughs> It seems to me, and I'm not a biologist, but it seems to me that um, you, would, you would construct a rubric in such a way that it gave highest emphasis to the accuracy, the thoughtfulness, the thoroughness with which students had conducted the experiment even though it didn't work. And um, it's almost in a way like, um, like our colleague here in English saying, it doesn't matter uh, that you have an interpretation of this piece of literature that might be different from mine, just so long as you have followed the criteria for good literary analysis. That is, you are advancing a reasonable position. You are backing it up with evidence and so on. So you are making a reasonable attempt to conduct this experiment as a scientist. You are following carefully the rules of laboratory procedure. You are, you know, um, you're being a good scientist. And, and it might be possible to say all scientists sometimes have experiments that don't go as expected. And as a matter of fact, perhaps not here at school, but um, if you read the history of great scientific breakthroughs, don't you, uh, in certain instances, find that the breakthrough resulted from some mistake or something that went wrong, and all of a sudden, whoa, you have an unexpected finding. And then somebody thinks, oh, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> This could be penicillin, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whatever. Stand up. Who are you? A non-mental historian. I'm wondering if you could have in your rubric something that says, why do you think your experience failed? So the student think uh, about it and, and then reflect. Still, the, the critical thinking is still at play. So I don't know if that would be useful. So this way, even though the experiment has failed, the student is still thinking, what did I do wrong? Why would that have better? And yeah. even why did the experience succeed could be also. Sure. So ask the student to reflect on what has happened. Why did this experiment fail? Or if this, if even for those for whom the experiment succeeded, what does that mean for them in that context? Why do you think this? Or just what thoughts do you have now? Or what would be the next piece of work? That's what I sometimes ask my students as well. What, what do you think would be the next piece of work to carry forward the, the uh, quest for answers to this question. Stand up. Don't so bad biology. Uh, how do you convey uh, this, <coughs> the, the differences, like unusually thoughtful for different uh, year levels? This is where I get a little bit stuck in my, in my rubrics, because what I'm expecting in the second year level is as unusually good, yes. is different from what I'm yes. expecting in fourth. In for so how do I put that in words and examples? I would suggest that um, the most effective rubrics are assignment and level and discipline specific. So if I'm assigning a paper of literary analysis or a biological um, experiment or inquiry to a second year student, it w the rubric would be different than for a fourth year student. That way, it's still possible for a few really good students to achieve the top level of the rubric, and yet, um, you've calibrated it, and so you've calibrated it for their use. 
Um, some people say, well, you know, there's a high, high standard here and most of the students won't reach it. I think that's kind of a downer <laughs> for students to get that back. Other questions or comments on this issue of establishing standards, dealing with subjectivity, and dealing with fairness and consistency along the way. Uh, Milton Schlosser, and I teach in music, and I also specifically, I teach with lecture courses, but also in performance. And in Canada, uh, many pianists, when they're trained as children, are used to actually rubrics uh, when they take exams in Canada for piano. They're marked so much on this, so much on that. And so our students come to us with that ingrained in them. And ironically, we, ought, we have to fight against that uh, a little bit. But I guess uh, like, uh, in terms of rubrics and subjectivity, which of course in the performing arts were often, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it is, there are wars fought over this, right? And piano <laughs> competitions, right? Um, but on the internet, I find rubrics for beginning piano, but I don't find it for the advanced level. And like in your consulting, uh, in this general sort of notion of subjectivity in the performing arts, like have you consulted with music departments, for instance, for those advanced students? And many of them do not use rubrics for just the reason that you have stated. Whether one uses a rubric or not is up to the individual and the situation, I think. And if your students are used to seeing rubrics as recipes that result in cut and dry kind of stilted work that just tries to meet the rubric, you may want to abandon the rubric because its format is no longer useful for this group of students. However, you do owe it to your students to communicate to them what you know about the shared uh, uh, criteria for performance in the field. And sometimes it's best done with examples. So, you know, two recordings of a piano piece, uh, ask them what would be the standards by which we would judge between these two and how would you apply those standards. So give them a chance to generate and to work with the standards. Um, in fact, that's a great principle all the way along. Um, I have a biologist, worked with a biologist who has her students do oral presentations of their research and she generated the rubric by first asking the students to in, take a few minutes in class and say, what to you would make a good presentation on somebody's biological research? And she wrote the uh, things that they suggested. And they were pretty good suggestions because oral presentation is something students listen to all the time <laughs> and something that they have some ideas about what they'd like to see. So, okay, the visuals are clear, the person makes eye contact, speaks clearly, and so on. The science is, is solid and well explained. And so then she go, she went home and worked these suggestions by the students into a rubric and you know, uh, made sure that she had her own, her own expertise as well. But that was a largely student-generated rubric. And then it, it means something to them because they see, okay, these rubrics generate the shared values of an audience. That's how a rubric comes to be. It's not a whimsical torture instrument <laughs> constructed by a teacher. Um, with Lynn Psychology, I'm wondering what your opinion is on providing students with samples of previous student work that is considered exceptional or good. Um, opinion about providing students with exceptional work from previous classes. If you handle it carefully in terms of privacy issue, um, I think it's a powerful tool. A little caution, if you don't want it to become to them like a model that they think they have to follow, present a couple of different pieces of work that achieve excellence perhaps by somewhat different routes and talk a little bit about it. I would like to suggest to also present some bad ones and then they are happy to see that you can do better <laughs> and you see what are the faults. It's easier sometimes to see what's bad about something and what's just good. And because I do in my classes, they have a chance to rewrite. So I present a bad one, and after that, I present a good one. And so we say, cool, there's hope. <laughs> yes, there's hope. Okay. That's, that's a great suggestion. All right, so um, rubrics can be useful, they need to be managed carefully and thoughtfully, they don't need to be recipes. 
and they don't need to appear to students as idiosyncratic standards that you made up, but rather rubrics at their best provide a teaching opportunity. What I'd like to suggest next um, is the issue of grading students on grammar and spelling and not the main issue. So let's talk about what to do about grammar and punctuation and spelling. And by the way, let's also talk about the um, things that come up when you have students who speak English as, their, as not as their native language. So it may be their second, their third, their fourth language. <clears throat> and they may have more or less facility with English spoken versus English written versus English <coughs> writing comprehended, like in a textbook. So we have students in this, multi, in this global multinational environment in which we increasingly live. We have students with all kinds of oddly shaped facilities in different kinds of languages with which they have grown up or transferred here or heard at home or whatever. So the first thing is to be um, sensitive to the issue of second language or third language. And it doesn't always show up in spoken accent. Some of your students may not may speak English with an accent that sounds native to you, but in fact they are working in a second language. So you have to be careful about that. And their writing, their writing in that language may be different. My own mother grew up in a Dutch-speaking home. She spoke English. She has gone to heaven now. She uh, spoke in where God speaks Dutch, we all knew. <laughs> it was a good thing she knew the language. <laughs> But um, she spoke English without accent. But in fact, English was her second language. And there are many, many Canadians and US citizens who are like that, and you have to be aware of that in a school setting. My mother could not read Dutch very well at all. She read Dutch by sounding out the letters to herself aloud and listening to what it said. And if she could figure out how it would sound, then she understood it immediately because all her experience was with spoken Dutch. And I just use that example to illustrate the very odd profiles of language facility that many of our students these days come to us with, and that their facility in written, oral, spoken, and comprehension, comprehension languages may be different. So that complicates the issue a whole lot. In addition to that, we have students come, coming to us from various socioeconomic strata, from various geographic areas, and um, from, from families where literacy practices may differ quite a lot. So the language of the home, um, the kinds of questions, there's a famous piece of work research that has been done about the kinds of questions that mothers ask, or the kinds of conversation that mothers have with their small children. And in the United States, which is where this was done, it differs by racial composition of the home and by socioeconomic class. So the, mother, uh, in the mothers in one kind of home will ask different kinds of questions of the children than in another kind of home and expect different kinds of responses. And then there's the whole issue that you have with Aboriginal populations of the culture of learning. What is the role of language, written and spoken, in language? And in relation to figures of authority, when does the student speak, when does the student not speak? You all are more familiar with all of this stuff because you're dealing with Aboriginal students than I am. Um, but I know those issues are there for you. So the issue of grammar and punctuation is a very um, complex issue. And it's deeply embedded in issues of culture, issues of personal pride and shame, issues of socioeconomic class and of racial divides, so it's, it's very, very tricky to handle. Here's, here are some suggestions. One suggestion is to divide the work in your, in your class into formal and informal writing, which as a matter of fact mirrors what happens in the world out there. When I am writing, for a professional purpose, let's say a committee report to be presented to my colleagues and the administration at my college, I am very careful to edit my work very carefully and have somebody else look at it 
grammar and punctuation and spelling and sentence clarity and all that. When I'm going to the grocery store, and I can't remember whether carrot has two R's or two T's or one of each, I do not bother to look it up in the dictionary. I put some approximation of the word on my grocery list just so that when I get to the produce counter, I can pick those long orange things and put them in my basket. <laughs> Likewise, when I'm working on this proposal that I'm going to send, I don't necessarily worry about grammar and punctuation in my draft. If it's just for my eyes, I'm only trying to get the words down. So you can, you can use that fact, as a matter of fact, in your classroom and say, all right, I, I want you tomorrow, for tomorrow or for next time we meet, I want you to read chapter four, and I want you to answer these four questions about the readings. And this is informal writing, so I'm not going to look at grammar and punctuation in a detailed way. As long as I can understand what you're saying, it will be fine. That's informal writing. Explain to your students that they must never use informal writing in a situation where their audience expects formal writing. And then have at least some work in your class that requires formal writing and make that very, very clear to them. This requires formal writing. So there's one suggestion. Make a distinction between formal and informal writing in your classroom. The informal writing gives your students, no matter what their facility with written English, gives your students a forum for expressing and playing with ideas, for being heard, for saying in a more free way what they think. And, and it's not different from the doodling that artists do or the dribbling that basketball stars do um, out on their garage hoop after supper at night. I mean, it's, it's just kind of ball handling, right? Fooling around, playing with language, using it to build um, general skills of fluency, but not worrying too much now about the editing for grammar and punctuation. What that practice does also <clears throat> is to help your students overcome a particular propensity on the part of people who are nervous about their writing. And this has shown up in some uh, very well-known research in which Sandra Pearl, um, a researcher, asked students who were, who were uh, classified as basic writers, that is, students who upon entry in the, into college-level work were struggling, struggling to meet the most basic requirements for college-level writing like coherent sentences <laughs> and, and basic grammatical features. Okay, so these are basic writers. And she asked them, as they were completing a writing assignment, to think aloud whatever they were thinking in their heads. Their finished writing at the end of this exercise looked as though they had never given a thought to grammar and punctuation. Guess what? The think aloud tapes revealed that they were obsessed with grammar punctuation, obsessed. That they spent a lot of time spinning their wheels, worrying about should it be this way, 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 feeling scared and inadequate. And that scared, inadequate feeling interfered with their ability to express their thoughts, to put anything worth saying down on that paper. So what informal writing does for your students is to help to free them from that obsession, that fear, and give them a chance to practice their fluency in a more forgiving environment. I was taught German um, by uh, an instructor who made that same distinction between occasions when uh, he wanted us to be quite careful about the German grammar and uh, accuracy of the words and so on, and other occasions when he encouraged us to just spit it out and just make the best approximation you can, you know, use, use grammatical instructions you're not yet quite in control of, use words that you don't quite know, I mean, uh, make up a, a, a German equivalent of an English word, I mean, just, just get it out, just let it flow. And that skill was enormously valuable to me when I went to live with a German-speaking family. <laughs> because I was not all tied up, I could just let it flow. And they would say to me, Barbara, <laughs> you're coming through. <laughs> Come through. <laughs> Come through. So creating
create that kind of space for your students. Now, here's the other piece. You do want to help your students, whatever their background in written English, to produce informal occasions, something quite close to edited standard written English. As, that's what we call it. And I would suggest that you don't refer to it as good English or bad English. And you don't refer to it as correct English or incorrect English, the reason I'll explain in a minute. But you ask students to be able to produce edited standard written English, as we call it. Here it is, E-S-W-E, as -E. That's a linguistically based term rather than a judgmental term. Now the reason for doing that is something I think you can explain to your students. And that is several facts about language that linguists have uh, long and solidly averted. All languages are rule driven. So there is a rule for my mother works at IBM, works at IBM. And there is a rule for my mother, she work at IBM. There is a rule for both of those constructions. And those who say it the second way are as rule driven as those who say it the first way, but the rules are different. That's principle number one you want to get across to your students. So non standard constructions are not degenerate or rule free. Um, <clears throat> bastardizations of, of the real thing. It's not that way. Second, all languages change all the time. That's why we don't speak now in the same way that Chaucer spoke. Chaucer was speaking in his time the language of London, the language of the predominant area. So it's not it's not that he was speaking a bastardization. He was speaking the English of his day. And it's very different from the English of today. So all languages change all the time. And they change according to geographic location, ethnic and culture factors, socioeconomic class, gender in some instances, and purpose. So languages change for good reasons. And here's the fourth principle arising from the first three. There is no language that is inherently superior to other languages. No form of language that is absolutely superior. Standard English is absolutely no better than all the forms of what we call non-standard English. It simply is the, le the form of English that is uh, expected in formal government, citizenly, business, and educational settings. Now, how did one form of language get to be standard? This is the fifth thing you want to tell your students. How did one form of language get to be standard? Got to be standard because it was the language of the people in power. So language is deeply entwined with issues of power and influence, status, and the lack thereof. And in, in virtually every society, um, at least advanced society, language differences are used as a handy dandy way to make judgments about a person's level of education, their socioeconomic status, their, their um, uh, cultural and ethnic background, and their worthiness to be heard. Their worthiness to be heard. So it's a deeply flawed, deeply sexist, racist, a classist society in which we live, we do that. And those factors affect our language use. Now, just be, so I would say those five things to my students. And make clear that they understand that what they're being asked to do in school is not to leave behind forever the language of their homes, their communities, their cultures, their socioeconomic class. But rather, they are being asked to do what linguists call code switch. So you switch from the code of your home to the code of school and business. 
you're learning two varieties of language. If you grew up speaking in your home something that was very close to edited standard or English, you have an advantage. But even if you didn't, you can learn it. Human beings are great language learners. Our brains are formed to learn language. And we can learn to code switch. People do all the time. Many people in their daily lives switch between several different codes, and sometimes they do diff between different codes in different languages. So you can learn, and we will help you. That's the message we want to give to our students. You can learn sta edited standard written English, regardless of what other forms of language you speak elsewhere. You can learn edited standard English, and we will help you. That said, we have a standard here for standard English, no pun intended. And you can express that standard to your students, and you can hold them to it. So don't get me wrong, I am not soft on grammar and punctuation. These students are in our care. If they can't command edited standard written English in the business and uh, civ uh, civic settings, they will suffer deeply. They will be silenced. If your voice is going to be heard in the mainstream society, you need to control edited standard written English. Not fair, that's the way it is. So the purpose of the education that students receive here at this institution is in part to help them be heard in the seats of power. And they need edited standard written English. So let me show you what one instructor does about that. In this very literature uh, rubric that we've been looking at, on page 21, of this rubric, and it says grammar punctuation. The highest standard is there are no discernible departures from Esri. Level four, there are a few. Level three, there are no more than an average of two per page. And you can set that however you want to. You can allow 20 per page or one per page or whatever you want. There are more than two. And at the very bottom, the departures from Esri interfere seriously with meaning. And here are the critical areas. And I think this is important because uh, I find a lot of um, difficulty in it until um, these kinds of lists came up. Um, it was difficult to tell whether, um, how to evaluate the relative seriousness of students' departures from Esri. A, a comma misplaced within a sentence, is that the same as a sentence fragment? Is that the same as a verb and subject that don't agree? I mean, eh. And besides, if you're not a grammarian, how do you make sense of all this anyway? Do you still remember you put that modifier this on? Huh? Huh? That verbal <laughs> conjunction. Do you still remember what a a verbal conjunction is? Okay, then. Um, you're not up the creek. Never mind. You're okay. Here's the here's the standard that this instructor uh, states. In these critical areas, if you uh, depart from edited standard written English, you're going to be Spelling or typo. Sentence boundary punctuation. So run-ons, commas, places, few sentences, fragments. Those are some of the words that students may or may not remember from high school. But it's basically putting the periods where the periods need to be. Use of apostrophe, S, and ES. The it's, it's issue, right? Come on over Pronoun forms. Pronoun forms is one of the areas on which forms of language vary. You remember my example. My mother works at, um, at IBM versus my mother, she works at IBM. So that repetition of the pronoun is typical of some versions of English that you'll find. In other versions, you'll find that the, um, the, pronoun, that, that, that the pronoun is totally different. Pronoun agreement and providing antecedents, verb forms and subject verb agreement, use of gender neutral language, capitalization. Now, 
That, that list is actually research-based. What the researchers have done is to give right to people, uh, to professors, and also to business people out there, and say, identify all the departures from Edward's standard written English, and tell us how serious you think this, this problem is. So the people went through and did this, and of course, they don't all identify the same departures, but this is the list of stuff that people report bothers them the most. So that's where the list comes from. And you can talk to your students about trying to command these aspects, however many of them there are, eight or nine, um, these aspects. And you can encourage them to work systematically on them so that your students don't feel just totally overwhelmed, like I can't make any mistakes and I make them all the time and every time I put a pen to paper I'm going to make a mistake and the lightning bolt is going to hit me. No, no, no. <laughs> right? Work on one thing. When you have that a little bit more under control, work on something else. You can work with your writing center. Um, have students go to the writing center and work on one or the other kind of thing. So try to corral this <coughs> edited standard written English thing into a manageable, uh, definable set of skills that you want students to. So that's one way to do it. Now, there's another way to do it. And that is, um, on page uh, 13. 13. of the standards for their grade. It's grade based. It's not a rubric per se, it's set up a little differently. And what the instructor does is to make 11 statements, goes a little bit over on page 14, that describe the kinds of papers that he gets as a history professor asking for argumentative essays about historical issues. And then he has given approximate grade equivalents, although you'll see that, for example, um, it's not totally clear where each of the letter grades starts or begins. For example, is number three um, an F or a D? Number four, is that an F or a D? So he's left himself some wiggle room in there, but this is basically the grade progression. Now, read these over and tell me how he handles the issue of grammar and punctuation. And then it's okay to say to students, 
this was a little bit distracting. Your, your uh, departures from Esri were a little bit distracting. They were quite distracting. They were totally distracting. And base it on that. Do, do it back. Questions? Comments? Experiences? <laughs> Sir, stand up. Where are you? Um, related to this approach as a whole, there's often a concern from students that we emphasize deficits. That our evaluation, of course, points out weaknesses rather than strengths. Because you know, we really want to tear them down and make them feel bad every day. Um, but I'm wondering here, because I quite like the structure of this, but it begins from an F. The first thing the student sees is how not to get an F in this class. And I'm wondering if you have any context on whether that's a deliberate design in the presentation of this, whether it's been evaluated or tested, what happens if you give it to students with here's how to get an A, which is how some of us also approach it, and how this translates as well to how they internalize the different elements of content. You know, that, that's a really, um, uh, it's a really smart comment, and it comes up in lots of workshops where I use this sheet that the history instructor con constructed. And in the same workshop in which this history instructor appeared and shared this with us, there was a sociologist who said exactly what you such a downer story with that all the stuff he did. And so the sociologist, for his own class, tried to flip it. So his, his sheet starts with what has been accomplished. So it will say, D, there is factual information present that relates to the topic. <laughs> right? And the errors, in fact, are not so serious as to be totally, uh, totally erroneous, right? There's some truthful, factual stuff in here as a D. C, there's truthful factual stuff, not too many terrible errors, and you've got a thesis. D, uh, B, and you've provided some support. B, great support for the thesis, and some mention of counter arguments. A, you know, so it goes like that. So at each step, it, it says what has been achieved. We talk about the issue of how to encourage students in our comments as well. There was a question here about um, what do students attend to and how to ensure that students read the comments and what kind of feedback is useful. Well, some research uh, has shown that about 80 or 90 percent of what we write back to students on their papers is negative. And other research has shown that they don't read it. They don't read our comments. Especially they don't read it when it's a final paper. Sometimes when it's a draft that they can revise, they'll read. Um, but, um, but when it's a final paper, they often don't read our comments. And in fact, I did some of this research myself. I did not publish it, but I'll tell you about it. I was in the women's restroom at the University of Cincinnati in the US, <laughs> in one of the main classroom buildings. <laughs> and there were two students in there who had just gotten out of class and just gotten their papers back. I don't think they they knew there was a teacher in the room. <laughs> so one of them said to her friend, what'd you get on the paper? And the friend said, ah, I only got a B. She said, I was really disappointed. She went on to say this. He wrote all over it. He must have wrote a book. I never even read it. <laughs> Isn't that sad? <laughs> you know, I'm the one sitting there on a Sunday afternoon when I should be out walking in the woods or, or uh, with my family, right? Writing all this stuff that I think is going to be helpful to the students. So one of the principles for saving time in the grading process is don't write stuff they're not going to read. Don't give students stuff they're not going to use. We'll talk a little bit more about that principle, but it's coming up right here in the framework um, of, of, this, of, of this issue here. So um, let me get back to the grammar and punctuation issue in this particular one. You can say to students, uh, I want you to achieve edited standard written English. And you can go to the writing center, but here's, here's another suggestion about the grammar and punctuation. Probably about 50% of what you see, and I made that number up, <laughs> uh, based on my own experience, and, on, and actually on some um, a whole lot of what you see, there we go, a very unscientific statement. A whole lot of what you see on your desk in terms of departures from ESWI is careless or incompetent proofreading. It's process. 
a lot of that stuff, and this is a, a research study that was done, if you go along and put a check mark next to the line where the departure from Esri occurred, more times than not, the student will be able to identify what the departure was. You've narrowed their, their uh, attention. You've called their attention and you focused their attention on that one line. So we take a page from that book. We think, okay, part of this is a process issue. And it's easier for me as a historian or a physicist to teach good proofreading practices than it is to teach grammar. So what I'm going to try to do is to eliminate all the careless stuff from my desk. And you can do that by helping your students learn how to pay attention, how to understand how important SB is, and how to proofread. So what some instructors do, here's a specific suggestion, collect all the papers, keep them for three or four days at least, then hand them all back. <laughs> <laughs> without any comment. And say, now read this with a stranger's eye. This used to work better when the paper copy they handed in was their only copy. Now, of course, they have all kinds of copies all over the place. But tell them, don't read this paper. Leave it alone, three, four days, leave it alone, and then you're going to get it back, and I'm not going to have read it, I'm not going to make any comments on it. Then I want you to read it again with fresh eyes. That itself will do a lot. Here's a second strategy. Ask students. They're not totally um, unknowing about their own issues with grammar and punctuation. It's been pounded into them all the way through high school. And if they've been out of high school for a while, nonetheless, they may have had somebody um, correct or talk with them, or they just simply know themselves what they're prone to. Okay? So say to students, I want you to make a list of the one, two, three things that you most frequently have trouble with in terms of producing as we, and then I want you to read your paper before you hand it in once for each of those things. So if I have a problem with it's, it's, or more generally with apostrophes, I'm going to read my paper just for apostrophes. That's the second strategy that you can teach them. Third strategy, get an editor. Every one of us, when we publish our own work, do we do our own editing? The journal or the publisher puts an editor on the job. Even for an English teacher like me, my book that came out last week, guess what? They put an editor on the job, she found some grammar punctuation stuff. Even though I have gone over and over and over, and I know all this stuff, I teach this stuff. But you can't necessarily see it all. So you need an editor. Every writer needs an editor in times of high stakes writing. So ask the students, how can I get an editor? I can go to the writing center. I can find somebody who, uh, whom I trust pretty well to know this stuff. But what they must not do is simply hand it to somebody else to be fixed. Instead, they must sit down with their editor and go through it. And the editor says to them, um, should this be who or whom? And the student says, hmm. Hmm. I don't know. And the editor says, well, I'm not sure either. <laughs> right? So they look it up. But what you want from your editor is to call attention, to do that same thing that that checkmark did, focus attention. And even if they end up neither one knowing and getting it wrong, at least in, in some of those cases, they will pick up on stuff that they fixed uh, in terms of as we end, and the paper will be more effectively edited. So, um, here's a fourth strategy you can teach your students. Don't be afraid to leave grammar and punctuation issues until the end. Do not obsess with grammar and punctuation in very early drafts because it keeps you from paying attention. Remember, human attention is a finite resource. Attention is a finite resource. So don't spend your attention on grammar and punctuation too early. Instead, spend it on the content and the argument Pros, if you are inserting here into your uh, math, into your math work, pay attention to grammar and punctuation at the end. Here's another. What are we on? Six. Here's another. Give your students some suggestions about proofreading, and the main one is 
to proofread, not for meaning, and not for everything at once, but for one or two things. So now I'm going to look at my work. It's akin to what we said before. Pick your three most things that you most. But a student could take this list of things that the literature teacher writes, spelling and typo, can I work right? I'm going to check my paper for spelling and typo. Next thing is sentence boundary punctuations. I'm going to check my paper for that. Show them the strategies that they can use to focus and narrow their attention. And the final thing is time, 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 time. Our students do not realize, by and large, how much time experienced writers spend editing their work for sentence clarity, grammar, and punctuation. And what I sometimes do is I bring in a draft of my own with track changes that's been done on track changes or if I was writing it by hand where I crossed out and all, uh, and all that. And I show them the number of changes that I made. And I tried it this way and I tried it this way and I tried it this way and I tried it this way. It could be a single sentence, it could be a paragraph. How much that thing changed. And, how, and then I say to them, how much time do you think I spent revising this paragraph? And now this book or this article that I published or this committee report that I sent in or this grant proposal that I sent in had you know, 537 paragraphs. How much time do you think I spent proofreading and revising at, uh, this piece of work? And they go, whoa. <laughs> and that's what you want. Whoa, the whoa factor. Here's a sheet that you might be able to use. It's broader than grammar and punctuation. Final papers, right? 
My paper has a clear thesis, and it was stated within the first couple of paragraphs of the paper. If it's not there, it's not ready for me. So you can ask your students to self-check this kind of stuff. And one of the things you can ask them to self-check is, did they go over the paper themselves for grammar and punctuation, and did they get it? All right. Questions, comments about these kinds of exercises? Okay. First, uh, Sean Bolton, are the students honest? Like, some of those subjects? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? At least I put my expectations in front of them. Did Melanie history? Uh, there's a few things that I took out of your last 10 minutes about the explanation about uh, Jonathan's comment on uh, grammar. The first one, no, just the last minute, is that what you do is that you delegate back to the student, and that I really like, that the student have engagement, and the one responsible for it. Before you said that, uh, the way I understood Jonathan's comment is that when I have a paper in front of me, I'm grading it, and I do spend time on grammar and stuff, and sometimes it takes me away from the main ideas. And all the tricks you give us, which are really good, delegate to others, I mean, to uh, the writing center, to the editor, so, but me as a professor, what can I do? And I'm going to use some of your uh, terminology or something like that to talk about a whole bunch of research that talk about, that says that students don't read the comments or the students know the grammar, they already know the grammar. So I want to talk about the other bunch of students, that's the same vocabulary, who don't know the grammar. So what can I do myself to help them? And I'm going back to my own experience as an undergraduate, where one TA took the time to tell me that the first time you write about an author, you put the full name. So that I learned back when I was an undergraduate, because that TA took, me, took the time to write that for me. You may hear, I have the accent, so <laughs> I'm not a native, but I did learn more grammar, written grammar and stuff. I think I write, but not better than I speak. But anyways, um, PhD, my supervisor was going and was making a squiggle on stuff. The little check mark you're talking about? No clue what he meant in years. What was that little thing, you know? Like, if you don't explain it, I was the one who didn't know that grammar rule, but the way it was. So, back to Jonathan's comments, I think we want to help the bunch who wants to learn and who do not know things. So how, I mean, there's, there's lots of tricks, and I, I will keep, but you know, for those ones, what do you do? And once I attended a, another workshop, I talked about teaching everyone, even math students, um, <laughs> how to write. And I remember Neil, you were at that workshop, and I don't remember who was giving a workshop, but he said, you know, have some pet peeves. Yes. You can decide that for my course me, I go with passive tense. I don't like students to write in the passive tense, so that's what I do. I don't know how many of you focus on this. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these other jobs can be, you know, like, I do the yes, do, but I mean, they're not supposed, there's no abbreviation in my uh, text you're not supposed to do, so it never has the IT apostrophe yes. It doesn't make sense. It is. You don't want to see it, so and it doesn't exist in my papers. But I think that, uh, to me, that was really successful for your question, is that I don't spend so much time on every single thing, because that's going to be like the washroom story. Hey, she wrote the book and I didn't read it for the comments, you know. So instead, I just focus on a few, and those are my pet peeves. I don't know if they think it's not fair, it's only the francophone teaching English that uh, has these things, but they know about it now. So that's what I would suggest to you, is that we do still spend a bit of time not delegate completely, if not, nor to the, the student is good to delegate to them, but not to everything else, but we do spend the time, but not so much time. So, you're dead on. And here's the principle. Don't mark every departure from ESLI in students' work. The research shows that it is not worth your time to do that. Instead, what you might do is exactly what she suggested. Pick a couple of things, 
They can be your pet peeves. They can be whatever the student um, has written uh, as his or her main areas of concern. Uh, okay, I'm working on it's it's. I'm working on passive, not using the passive voice. Let the student be your guide. Okay, this is what I'm going to look for. Just this. Or you can do the, a couple of paragraphs, careful marking for grammar, just to give them an idea of what it looks like. But don't mark the whole paper for issues of grammar and punctuation. The research suggests it is not, you don't get a big enough bang for your buck. Instead, work on process, work on focused issues that you can teach to your students. I think uh, perhaps my colleagues' comments, which are much appreciated, you said uh, something that is very important, that's the word expectations. And not just communicating our expectations to our students, but understanding that their expectations of their, themselves in terms of performance, in terms of capacity, in terms of ability, in terms of preparation, in terms of language, in terms of grammar, in terms of math, in terms of every single thing we have them to do, is going to differ immensely in many cases from what we often assume it to be. And they also have no idea what our expectations actually are. They simply know that we expect them to do well. And if they don't, well, it's probably somebody's fault. But finding a mechanism of reconciling and communicating their expectations and understanding that their expectations may not, even in an empirical way, coincide with ours. We found this with participation in the classroom. How often should you participate? Once or twice a semester. Faculty member, once or twice a class. That's a very big gap to fill. If it's not expressed, if it's not articulated, and I think this all is different ways of doing that, then we have, we'll never overcome that particular point because the two won't reconcile. That's a really good point. Take that link, exactly. Um, so Laura's actually just touched on something that I wanted to bring up. It's a bit of a tangent that goes back to uh, when you were saying that you, they can have uh, ways to express themselves that aren't formal. Uh, so we at this institution have the luxury of sometimes having very small class sizes which allows a lot more discussion, uh, which obviously we think encourages students to think more, to express their ideas more. Uh, but then when it comes to the point where you want to evaluate how they're progressing based on some of these discussions, you know, seminar course, and giving them articles to read, to come back prepared, discuss these ideas, then you're also dealing with personality types. You've got that person sitting in the corner who might know every single detail of those articles that's too many to speak up. Uh, so how do we evaluate participation if that's something that we want to bring out in our classes? Um, do you have any suggestions for that? Yes. We're talking about, we're not going to talk about how to encourage participation. It's not the topic of this workshop. But how to evaluate participation and so a narrow answer to your question, use a rubric or a check sheet. Actually, what I like best is a self-check sheet. And the self-check sheet that I use goes something like this. Students fill it out at the end of the class, but they've had it for a long time and they've gone over it and discussed it. And they fill it out every day that's the goal to do discussion. And they have to check these items. And the first one is, I made every attempt to be in class on time. I brought the materials that I needed, whether it was textbooks or notes or, or whatever I was asked to bring, I had them with me. I had read the assignment before class. Check, yes or no. And then I came to class well rested, well nourished, <laughs> and ready to do my best work. And the reaction you just had, that's what my students do, they snort, they go. <laughs> but it's my expectation, I put it there. Would you show up for a hockey game? If you were on the hockey team, would you show up for a hockey team at less than your best physically? No, you would not. So this class is more important to you than the hockey team. So show up, and I'll watch you at your best. Uh, I have a question. With multiple choice, especially in larger classes, um, how do you, you don't have a rubric. Right. Often, the way you indicate that it's incorrect is you make a circle on the right yeah. answer. Yeah. How do they get feedback when you have, let's say, in very large classes, which some of us do teach, um, how do you make sure that they get the appropriate feedback on that rather than just say, oh, thank goodness, this is going to be the easy part tomorrow? <laughs> like, they need some feedback, multiple choice, and you can post the answer to you. 
but is there is there, writing is, is there research that talks about how to deal with multiple choice as an effective feedback mechanism for students? That's a really good question, and yes, there is, and it depends upon classifying the multiple choice questions around certain learning outcomes that you want. So a, a teacher of nursing, for example, went through her multiple choice exams and classified them into those which were merely repeating what had been given in the textbook, so kind of memorization, um, and those that required the student to put together more than one piece of information in a somewhat new way, and those that required the student to think beyond the given protocols. So um, a certain medical situation might have a component in it that required you to depart from the normal thing you would do in this situation for a diabetic mother giving birth. Something else happens and so, whoops, all of a sudden now you have to think outside the box. So she had three levels of multiple choice questions. And she shared that classification with her students and tried to help them see where am I, where am I making my mistakes? Is it in the memorization of the factual material? Is it putting together multiple sources or is it thinking beyond the box? So it's that kind of analysis that they can do, I think. Um, I, I had an experience a, a few years ago where I received a, a letter from one of our graduates here. And in a senior course which involved an essay, uh, I couldn't really comprehend what he was trying to say. And so it was, I'm not trained in grammar, etc. although I live with one. Um, <laughs> you know, Marian, sorry. Um, but I, I did my best, but I gave up. I couldn't really read it. And what surprised me was I asked him, and I was a small class, which some of us have the luxury of here, but I asked him if, if uh, anyone else had ever expressed concerns about his writing, and his answer was no. And, and so I, I guess my, my point of uh, kind of reinforcement is that sometimes just saying it's incomprehensible, as you noted, is enough. And I think we underestimate, we think other people may be pointing it out, but this student was third, fourth year, he had done all the major disciplines on our campus, and I was the one who ended up telling him. Anyway, the letter said to me, I was, he was so glad that he did that, he was a student from Syria, and uh, you know, he went on to get an architectural degree, but he had not been told, and he went and actually got assistance in his writing skills. So, so much of education today, which I appreciate, is transformation in the immediate, right? Let's, in this class, show me how you change things. And you're talking about that. But I guess I also would like to point out that there is also transformation that takes over a longer period of time. And sometimes it is just saying it's incomprehensible. You need to know that. It's not. There's a principle um, explained in the handout called don't spend the most time on the worst paper. It's a temptation. Oh my God, get the red pen out and go for the uh, uh, comment function on your words. Or fill it all up. That stuff is unlikely to be pedagogically effective for learning. Instead, what I suggest is that you respond. And now we're talking about what kind of feedback is useful. Feedback should be prioritized. If the paper is, does not address uh, the assignment or does not have what you expected in terms of a main point or a set of recommendations or whatever else you're asking for, just say that. If it's clear to you that there has not been enough time spent on this paper, just say that. And you can tell that by that opening law that says, I don't know how much time did you spend on this paper, right? So let's take a look at um, student paper here. This is a fun one. Page eight. a student is asked to read a professional biological article 
in this case about the prey preference factors for a red-tailed hawk. And the scientific name for the hawk is given, I left that out. I have numbered the sentences in the student's um, paper for ease of our references, um, and I'll give you just a moment to read what the student wrote. And the question at hand is, how would you respond to this student paper?
can leave it at that. I mean, this we set up the, the process, right? This is not going to be that this is not going to be responded to. This is not going to be revised. Now, if the student were going to revise this, or if this were an informal exercise that were being discussed in class, then you might handle it in a different way to say, okay, what was the problem here? Did you try to read the article? Did you read the article more than once? Did you read the first paragraph and the, and the um, discussion? Did you read the discussion section of the article? Because that's often the place in a scientific article where a little bit more lay language is used and the implications of the study are drawn out in perhaps what might be some of the clearest language. How did you go about this? Um, and, and then try to help this student to increase his or her time on task, which may be the issue. This may be a time on task issue. But if the student had really tried, um, he or she could have understood this article and presented what it said in clear prose. But clearly, that is not what's happening. Furthermore, what makes me so sad is that <laughs> even if the student did understand the article and just didn't communicate properly, there's no curiosity here, right? There's no thinking like a scientist. There's no, wow, it's that interesting. You know, this, the hawk in this situation would prefer the largest mass. You can understand that it's more to eat. But then there are some situations where it doesn't. And it changes. Well, how interesting is that? And I wonder what would happen if you gave the rat this kind of, uh, the, the, the hawk, this kind of prey. Or I wonder what, whether it's true with other exhibitors. I wonder, you know, you, 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 you think like a scientist, you go, know, wow! That's not happening at all, is it? So there's something broader going on here, which is an issue of engagement. This student is not engaged as a scientist in this literature. And I might also say something um, like, um, I couldn't understand what the experiment was, and I didn't, I didn't see your interest in it. I didn't see any engagement with what this was. I might also go back and think about the assignment, because in the original assignment, there is no audience specified. And that's often a misleading situation for students, because normally when you write in the real world, you have an audience. I might say, read this article and explain it to your sixth grade brother or sister, niece or nephew. Or explain it to a colleague in this class who hasn't read the article. So that you give the student an invitation to put it in lay terms. And then to say, I mean, the actual assignment did say, tell me about respond, uh, give a personal response to the article, absent. So here's an example of don't spend the most time on the worst papers. Ask yourself, how did this paper get to be this paper? What's the bottom line issue here? What is the real problem? What's the real problem? And say that. Because there's research that indicates that when students get back, and here we go to uh, what do students attend to with getting back the grade, and how do you get them to read your comments? Students will often approach a paper that they get back from comments in this fashion. They will start with the first line and take the marginal comment that's made there and they will try to fix it in as local a way as possible. Next comment, fix it, local way as possible. Next comment, fix it, local way as possible. And when they get down to the end and the professor says this paper has no thesis and it's not well organized, <laughs> you see that that is a contradictory message to give to the student. If the paper is not well organized, or it does not have a thesis, or is inadequate in support, or whatever else you're asking your discipline, just say that. Just say that. You do not have to mark every grammar punctuation error, <coughs> every unclear sentence, every place where <coughs> the uh, facts are wrong, or the uh, uh, research is not what well. you don't have to mark everything that you notice about a student's paper truly. It's okay to focus students' attention on the most basic problem. Because if you have them, it's like a building, right? You walk into a room. 
and you start to critique and change the wallpaper. If you ask a student to change the wallpaper when the room is out of kilter, it's useless. Because the wallpaper has to be destroyed, the room has to be straightened up, or the building has to be straightened up, and then you do the wallpaper. It's the same thing. If students get all involved in fixing the grammar and punctuation or the unclear sentences or the smaller level stuff, and they don't say, I need a thesis here, or I'm not supporting my points, then that you've, t you've distracted them. You've done them a disservice. You've distracted them with small level stuff when you should be pointing out the big level stuff. So I did that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, usually that kind of assignments or works uh, comes from students who are not great students. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be very harsh in their evaluations. <laughs> So they say Tom disrespects what I did, or Tom did not provide enough feedback. So how to deal with that? I mean, I, I, I see your point, but on the other side, they have power to criticize us. <laughs> so how to deal with it? Um, one of the things to do is to ask the student to hand in a self-evaluative sheet on the front of the uh, assignment. A self-evaluative sheet might say here, um, I read this article at least three times before I wrote about it. I have put the author's conclusions in my own words as I would say it to a classmate or to a sixth grade nephew. Or um, it is clear to a reader. I have tried it out on one reader, and that reader could understand what the experiments were. I have included a personal response in which I show a curious scientific mind at work. <laughs> Make them, make them analyze their own work. And then when it comes into you, if, if this is what they get, and the student has gone through and checked all the stuff on the check sheet, then it's patently clear that they have made up what they put on the check sheet. They don't, you know, this is, then, then I think you have the grounds to say, no, it's not clear. There's no personal response. You didn't read the article uh, three times or more. Or maybe the student writes in, on the sheet and give the student a, a way to comment. And the student may say, I read this, the article six times and I still couldn't understand what it was saying. So now, if that's true, now you've got a reading problem. And you can address it individually with the student, find out what kind of help they're getting, what kind of help you have here at Augustana that might uh, uh, enable them to read a scientific article and understand what it's saying. Maybe now you've got an issue that this student's going to have to deal with. So if they can't read professional literature at the college level, they have a problem. They don't have to address So uh, now, again, instead of marking the whole paper up with all kinds of stuff, you're getting at the basic issue, which is that the student tried to read this article with them. All right. Now I want to make a different suggestion. I want to kind of shift the <laughs> A huge, huge way to save time in the grading process is to give fewer assignments that you have to grade at home or in your office, one by one, on your own. So, suppose that in a given semester, you gave only one or two major assignments, and I'm not talking about little multiple choice or fact business methods. Suppose that you gave only one or two assignments, or that you reduced the number of assignments you're currently giving. And I want to tell you a story. There was a, a, a business management professor who was assigning eight case studies to his students across the course of a 16-week semester. These case studies were five to eight pages long, and he was getting them, therefore, every other week and just struggling with his other teaching load. Um, struggling, struggling, struggling to keep up with this huge paper load, especially as the class got bigger as the enrollment. And uh, uh, those of you who were there yesterday heard the good enrollment figures, but what it means is that some people's classes are going to increase in size a little bit, doesn't it? So as this college grew and the enrollment in his classes increased, the paper load became greater and greater. The answer in that situation 
is to rethink how you are using classroom time. And to try to use classroom time to give students feedback on their work. And that means making the students responsible outside of class for getting the stuff you would otherwise lecture. Now there's a diagram of this on page one, and I'm going to draw it here on the board. to come to class prepared, to spend the time. 
Suppose then that they prepared something in writing or in numbers <laughs> or in graphs or whatever that represented their first exposure and perhaps a little bit of initial process that we would ask them to do. And suppose that they would bring that to class. And suppose that in the class, they got process and they also got response. Now, Professor has a life. <laughs> Something to put on the via when promotion tenure time come along. Now, I'm being a little facetious because it's not that you will never take student home, work home and write comments on it one by one. But what I'm saying is, if you play with the use of classroom time, you can offer a lot of response to student work right there in the class. And here's how it works in almost any, it can be done in almost any class, and it's already been being done in a lot of your classes. Your art and design classes, for example, are studios, <laughs> and your music classes, and some of the classes in um, mathematics and in other technical dis disciplines. Students come in with their homework, they, uh, put the, they solve the problems on the board, they get responses right there. But let me just give a couple of examples of how this works in classrooms of faculty members that I have. So let's take this history professor who is teaching a uh, beginning level Western civilization course. And he has been uh, assigning these literary critical, uh, not literary critical, these uh, historical essays, uh, argumentative essays on various issues of historical significance for which we looked at the grading sheet, right? So it's that guy. And I watched him change over the years. He called his classes lecture discussion, but in actual fact, they were mostly lecture. If you went in there with a stopwatch, <laughs> you would see he was doing almost all the talking. And not very many students talked at all in the class. A few of the bright ones talked the most. Instead, what he started to do was to say, look, I could use the class time for process and response if I could get the students to read ahead of time. So what he did was to assign them each day a one-page written assignment which required them to read the textbook. And they had to bring this to class with them, and they had to send him a copy of it before the class began, or bring it to class, we could do it electronically with this one. But that ensured that they had done it before the class started, otherwise they couldn't sit there in class and do it. So they come in with two copies. You have one at the beginning of the class, and the student has one at her gym. In the olden days, let's say they were studying Louis XIV. Remember him, the Sun King, Bill Versailles, all that? Absolute dictator, okay? So they're studying Louis XIV. And the question he wants them to address is, was Louis XIV a good king for his time or not? How are we to judge him and how are we to judge absolutism as a form of government? Wonderful question. So the students come in and in the olden days, he would have started the lecture. He would have say, said, the issue on the table today is whether Louis XIV was a good king or not, and you were to read a collection of primary sources, including a guy named Bishop Bossuet and a guy named Saint Simon, and, um, you, and uh, you know, he would start talking. Now what happens is the students have in their hands a sheet, and it says, what is the issue at stake? What did Saint-Simon say about whether Louis was a good king? What evidence does he use to back it up? And how can his material be used as evidence on the issue of state? And so instead of starting to lecture, he starts in by saying, Julie, what's the issue of state? Or as Tom comes in the door, he may say, Tom, what was the issue at stake would you write on the board? James, would you help? It comes from the students. It depends on their preparation. It matters deeply whether they prepared for the class or not. Then he'll say, all right, what did Saint-Simon say about Louis? All right, he said Louis was a bad king. 
Why did he say that? What evidence does he have? How can this be used as evidence on the issue of state? Now the class is typically stuck because they don't know how to evaluate evidence. They know how to summarize written material. They don't know how to evaluate it as evidence. So we get stuck. Now the class is right where Jack wants them. And he starts eliciting the kinds of responses that he wants. San Simon was a member of the class that had the most to lose in terms of power from Louis's reign. And members of this class generally hated Louis and thought he was a bad king. And so you've got to take that into account when you evaluate what San Simon said. That's what he wants to hear. And he will get it. Out of these freshmen, he will eventually get it. And now he'll stop the class and he'll say, Talk to your neighbor. What is one thing that you learned from this discussion that you could use to improve your own answer that you wrote before the class today? And then write that down. Ha. He gives them a couple minutes to do that. He may work a little bit more, say, um, John, what did you write? Edward, what did you write? But basically, what he's done, he's given an assignment. They've written it. They've come into class. And in the class, he has given them a response. Now, what does he take home? The students take home their augmented and improved responses. What he takes home is the stuff they gave him at the very beginning of the class, showing that they had done it. But that stuff is now out of date. It's out of date because they've already gotten their response in the class. Edward has improved his answer. So, what's left to do is only to give the students credit for having completed the assignment before class. That's all you have to do. It takes one to two seconds per each. You go through, you say, okay, Bergman, did he do it? Yes. Louise, did he do it? Yes. Smith, did she do it? Yes. That's all. You can ask students, you can give a student, you can give students an assignment and feedback every class day. That's how I teach. That's how the historian teaches. That's how a physicist teaches that, that I have worked with. That's how lots and lots and lots of teachers teach, and it's called these days flipping the class. But it really is, it's not flipping so much as, as it is being more intelligent about how you use the times and spaces of your class. And if you do this, then you can reduce the number of finished formal assignments that you take home and grade in your own time. The flipped class actually saves you time and allows you to enhance student learning by giving them that active participation, that writing, that preparation, that homework that is all the research literature says absolutely crucial to them. So we're out of time, so I'm not going to take questions, but this process is explained at more depth in effective grading. You'll see a whole bunch of literature online on flipping the classroom. Many of you are already doing some of this, I'm sure. But my final suggestion to you, in addition to the, all the others, is rethink how you use the times and spaces available to you, particularly classroom time, to save your time by, by offering response to student work in the class. Thanks very much, everybody.